Um, I'm Amanda and I work for the Cooperative College and this is my, my colleague from the Cooperative Heritage Trust, Gillian Lornigan, who has been coming to the building for 36 years um, and prior to working for the college, Gillian worked for the Cooperative Union. Um, Gillian is an expert in all things co-op. Um, and has been a sort of stalwart of the movement for a very long time. And this is Gillian's last week of work because she's retiring at the end of the week. So this is a very, very timely um, webinar and we are able to, you know, hopefully, you know, we're all going to learn. Also, we've to engage someone else in. Right. Yeah, so, so, you know, we can hopefully, we'll learn loads from Gillian and also she, you know, she'll be able to respond to questions after the webinar. So what we're going to do is we're going to take us, Gillian's going to take us through a selection of slides, which are all super interesting. And then um, if you have any questions, you can either use the chat box, which is, which appears at the side, or you can also just sort of like make a note of any questions you have and we'll have a question and answer session at the end. So without further ado, I am going to share the slideshow. Right, greetings. Um, it being the centenary of the college, I have been asked to um, do a bit of a presentation on the college's history. Um, now, they're only being an hour for this presentation and there being a hundred years of history. And my predilection for starting rather earlier than um, going into the prehistory a bit. Uh, so it will be a bit of a whistle-stop tour, but I thought I'd talk a bit about college and who's been involved in it over the years, and also the places that it's been, because it's, it's had quite a, a mobile history around the place. So um, I'll, I'm happy to try and answer any questions that anybody has. Um, and I always tell people to bear in mind that I am a librarian and when I was at library school we were always taught that librarians don't have to know stuff, they need to know where to look it up. So I reserve the right to take difficult questions away and let you have the answers afterwards. Start off with a um, tiny little bit about the Cooperative Heritage Trust just in case any of you um, haven't come across it before. Um, it was created in 2007 in order to care for the heritage of the Cooperative Movement. And we have two things. One is the Rochdale Pioneers Museum, which I'm hoping everybody has already been to. Um, and anybody who hasn't really ought to, to be going there. Um, and the National Cooperative Archive which is the, um, the bit that I work with most closely. So, mention a little bit about the archive. We have three main um, features, main, main aims within the Heritage Trust for the archive and the museum, um, to preserve things, to make sure that they'll be available for future generations to learn from. Um, to make them as accessible as possible in as many different ways as possible and also to use them for education because education has a very long history within the co-op movement. Can I just ask Michael, can you still see a slide now? You can, cool. Right. So the National Cooperative Archive was actually formed in and the union. I worked for quite a few years with the Cooperative Union Archive. Um, it got silly in the 1990s because there were two archives, one with the Cooperative College, one with the Co-op Union, and we were sending researchers from one to the other. So we decided to bring them together to create the National Cooperative Archive. And of course, when you start to do that sort of thing, people suddenly come to you and they say, we've got this stuff, you can have it. So we doubled the collections overnight in forming the archive. Um, and then it's doubled again since. And very recently it's had another doubling. So it's somewhat larger than, um, than where I started. 
that's still doing the same sorts of things, bringing cooperative heritage to the members. And we, we take members in their, um, their widest uh, remit because anybody can become a member of the co-op society. So we, we make everything accessible to everybody. I said that education had a long history within the co-op movement. Um, the earliest documented cooperative society was the Fenwick Weavers, who in the 1760s up in Scotland were doing the first bits um, of documented cooperative retailing. Now their society was set up in 1761 in order to provide a friendly society for the weavers. But one of their major aims was to have a library for the members. So the, the co-op education goes way back. I should say we don't have those records. Um, the minutes are in the National Library of Scotland. Um, but in the, the way that archives share things with each other, they've let us have a digitized copy of the uh, Fenwick Weaver's minutes so that we can see them when we, when we need to. Coming on a bit further to the 1830s, um, there was a letter in 1830 itself from Charles Fry of the Liverpool Wholesale Purchasing Society. Um, he wrote to the British Cooperator, which was a periodical at the time, um, and suggested the setting up of a library or college. And that, as far as we're aware, is the earliest mention of a college within the cooperative movement. So you can see it took a while to come to fruition, um, but did in the end. The images are from the, a letter that was sent by Lloyd-Jones to Robert Owen, um, and it's dated 1836. And he was writing to Owen, but he wrote it on the back of an address, which was um, aiming at getting money to extend an educational institution for cooperators um, that was in Salford. And they had a library there, which had been already running for four years. And I've got a list of the things that they were teaching. Reading, writing, arithmetic, grammar, logic, composition, geography, geometry, astronomy, science, and philosophy. So for ordinary working class people, they were making all of these things available and really extending education um, to everybody. Later on, it was said that the Rochdale pioneers, um, some of the Rochdale pioneers, before they set up their society, went to visit that school to talk to people about cooperation. And we know that they picked up ideas from all over the place. And apparently this school in Salford was one of the ones that they, uh, they used. Now Robert Owen, and we have uh, 3,000 letters of Robert Owen in our correspondence collection. Um, he was known as the father of cooperation and was heavily involved in education. He believed that education should begin as soon as a child could walk out of its mother's arms. And that really shows the, the way cooperators thought about education. They felt it was for everybody of all ages. And the, the idea of lifelong learning was really nothing new to, to cooperators. Um, we've included a slide of the timetable for the school in New Harmony in the States in 1843. And it includes all sorts of different subjects for the, the students. They were doing reading, writing, and arithmetic, which you would expect. They were doing languages, geography, art. And they, in addition to all of the um, educational things, they were also doing vocational education because they were spending time on the farm and with the wheelwright really learning skills alongside the, um, the academic work. By the 1870s, people were starting to talk about higher education on cooperative lines. And it's interesting to see the way that the college is now developing a cooperative university, which was actually being talked about in the 1870s. Um, sometimes ideas take a while to to sort of come to, to fruition. Um, but in 1874, at Cooperative Congress, a gentleman called Mr. Morrison 
produced a paper on higher education on cooperative principles. And he was very keen that education should be given its full place within the cooperative movement. Um, some people were a bit dubious about spending too much on education when they felt that um, they needed to put more money into the business. But he was arguing that the education side was just as important to the members as that retailing side. Cooperative societies were extending their educational work. Um, societies like the Rochdale Pioneers were setting up libraries, they were holding courses, they were doing all sorts of different, different activities. Um, and in 1882, the Cooperative Union, which of course was formed in 1869, set up an education department. And the idea of that education department was to give support to cooperative societies in how they, they operate their educational activities. And they started to do courses, they would create cur curriculums, they had tutors who you could send for to come and do a course in your, um, in your premises. And they had examination papers, which are, are fascinating to see what was being studied. The first um, courses that they got going were interestingly bookkeeping because they felt it was something that everybody involved in cooperative societies should understand, both people employed by cooperative societies and also people involved in a democratic structure needed to know it. Um, so it was always going to be one of the, the best used courses. By 1912, ideas towards further education within the co-op movement were coming, coming together. And a gentleman called Fred Hall, um, who was a professor in Belfast at the time, I'll talk a bit more about him later, gave a paper at a weekend conference entitled A Cooperative College, which gives a feeling of what he really felt ought to be created. Um, and from that paper, which was repeated in lots of different meetings around the place, um, he created the College Herald Circle which was a, a sort of campaigning group looking at encouraging the cooperative movement to set up its own college. Um, and it also um, produced the College Herald, which I can move on to the next slide. Yeah. They produced a magazine called the College Herald, um, which talked about and campaigned for the, the cooperative college to be established. There was a bit of a delay, um, as you might imagine, because of the, the First World War. It was difficult for anything like a college to get going. So it was only in 1919 when the um, Cooperative College was properly established. Um, it was established at the Cooperative Congress, as everything to do with the co-op movement um, always has been. And the, uh, paper given to the Cooperative Congress um, said that work along college lines was now becoming inevitable. What they didn't specify was that uh, they'd actually had a full-time student for six months. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Thomas Schonk from Australia, he was there, um, his government paid for him to, to go and um, basically be a guinea pig. There's a, a really interesting article, an interview with him which talks about how he was getting involved in all sorts of different things um, and involved in, in, does this work, does that work? So he, he was really a bit of a guinea pig for him. Um, but the Congress resolution of that year set in place the Cooperative College, which started, of course, in Holyoke House in Manchester, which is back in Holyoke House now. Um, Holyoke House, just to, to give a bit of background, was built, um, it was opened on the 11th of November 1911, before the date 11th of November actually had significance, of course, it was just 11, 11, 11, it was a good, a good sort of date to, to choose. But it was established as the home for the Cooperative Union, um, a meeting place, and it was actually specified as a place where research should take place. Um, so some of the things that they wanted to, to do in building Holyoke House 
were having a library and having meeting spaces so that they could um, do things there. And this is where the Cooperative College first began. Um, started very small, of course, and gradually built up. By the 1930s, Holyoke House was bursting at the seams. Um, so an extension was planned. And the extension, as you can see from the different sizes, they're actually um, to scale those plans. Um, the smaller plan is the 1911 layout. Um, the larger coloured one is showing all of the extension. And they actually doubled the size of the building. And the new building, the new section opened in 1933. And the idea was that the Cooperative College would move into what had been the old building mm -hmm. so that the Co-op Union could all have the new building um, and the Co-op College could extend rather dramatically. One of the things they got out of it, of course, was a much larger meeting space. Um, and that meeting space was up on the second floor where a lot of the um, education activities went on for the Cooperative College. Um, and unfortunately, of course, December 1940, this happened. Um, the Manchester Blitz, a couple of days before Christmas in 1940, uh, destroyed the top floor of the building, which made it a bit difficult for the, the Cooperative College. And I'll, I'll say a bit more about that as well. But I thought I'd throw in, I'm just talking about the Cooperative College. Um, it wasn't operating in a vacuum. The college has always worked with other organisations. Um, and just to, to show this, I've got a, a paper talking about the relationship between the cooperative movement and the Workers' Educational Association, which they've always worked mm -hmm. very, very closely together. And this is a Congress 1925. Um, interestingly, the president of the WEA was ill. So they called in the Master of Balliol College, Oxford, to, um, to give the talk in his place, which is unusual. The students um, lived in hostels while the, the college was in Manchester. In 1924, they opened the first of the, the college hostels, which were um, at Kersal which is described as the sunnier side of Manchester, which in a place that's known as Rainy City, I'm, I'm intrigued by. Um, they eventually opened a second hostel next door. Um, opening the first hostel gave them space for 36 students um, to live in a reasonable amount of comfort. Um, and they were very keen to enable students to come together and to spend time together to do the informal learning that, that goes on. And during the college holidays, they um, used the hostels for week-long courses and weekend courses for people like the um, secretaries of cooperative societies, people involved in the democratic structure of societies could come and have, uh, have their schools as well. Just a, a nice picture of some of the, the students outside the hostel. And that really does show it was on the sunnier side of, of Manchester. Now, in 1940, when the college was bombed out of Holyoke House, all of the educational work was moved to the hostels. Um, so they were doing all sorts of new courses there that were considered suitable for wartime um, work. They were doing shorter courses because that was easier for people to come to. And they also set up training shops in the, um, in the hostels because a lot of people were coming in to replace people who would, had gone to war, but they weren't familiar with retailing. So it gave the opportunity for people to, to learn a bit about retailing as well. And of course, being cooperatives, um, there was a committee and the Cooperative College House Committee was established to discuss things to do with the college, all sorts of things to do with life in the hospitals and all sorts of different um, investment that was needed, problems that arose and things. The, in the early days, there was some interesting discussion around the idea of getting a wireless set 
for the um, students for their common room. Um, and of course, it makes you think because having a wireless in the 1920s was actually quite a big deal. You know, you, you needed quite a lot of infrastructure to make it work. So they eventually decided that they would get one. And then shortly afterwards, there was a request from the maids to have an extension speaker put in the kitchen so that the maids could listen to it while they were doing their work, which is rather a, a nice one. And there's a, a recurring uh, problem that's raised about the geyser that was there to make hot water. And it is never actually specified what the problem is, mm. um, but it just crops up again and again as the problem with the geyser. And they eventually decide that they will try and sort it out by moving the geyser into a shed outside. <laughs> so I presume it was noise, but I've got no, no way of knowing, unfortunately. Of course, by the time um, the college was bombed out of Holyoke House, it was already talking about the need for a residential college um, where the students could be on one site. There would be more facilities for students, more, um, more places for them to, to work and more capacity, of course. Um, so at the end of the Second World War, Stamford Hall was bought. Um, it was an amazing place, a stately home, not far from Loughborough. Um, and when the college moved in, apparently very little change had been made to it. They managed to get the money together to buy the building, but they didn't have any money for alterations. Um, and from the reports at the time, very little money for heating either, <laughs> which if you think of, of, they moved in in January, it has to be said. Um, in a stately home, they must have been pretty jolly nippy. Um, but the facilities that they had and the space that they had was quite, quite amazing. One of the things we have in the collection, apart from these lovely photographs of Stanford Hall, is a scrapbook that was put together in 1945 of articles in the newspapers and things about the college being established. So it gives you a good snapshot of what people were talking about the college at the time and what they were trying to achieve by moving all that way. The, when I say that they didn't have much um, opportunity to, to alter things at Stanford Hall, um, it really was true. The accommodation for the students was apparently pretty basic and it was dormitories and the um, students often complained because they were fed up with being in, in dormitories um, and quite a few of the students of the college of course had been in the armed services during the war so they were going from one lot of dormitories to another lot of dormitories and they weren't terribly impressed um, and apparently some of the um, dormitories were actually in what had been children's nurseries. So they had the nursery freezes around the walls, um, which must have been quite interesting. Gradually into the 1950s, um, a bit of money became available so that they could um, actually provide single rooms for, for students. Um, none of them on suite, of course, at that, that stage, um, and very simply furnished. So I've got a young gentleman here from the 1950s doing very busy doing his work, of course, because students only ever do their work, they never, yeah. never do anything <laughs> else, of course. Um, now, many of the college's students, of course, at the time, they came from different cooperative societies, and lots of co-op societies had scholarships to send their um, employees to, to the college. Um, but also students came through the British Council, the Overseas Development Administration, UNESCO, and all sorts of different organizations were sending students um, to Stanford Hall. Whole generations of um, government ministers of cooperation in Commonwealth countries came through the doors of Stanford Hall. Um, it's, very well known um, right the way across the country. And of course the working life 
we're still fairly um, Spartan. Two pictures. Um, the one on the left is from the 1950s. The, um, the one on the right is a management lecture from 1963. Um, now, of course, at this time um, in the 50s and 60s and through into the 70s, management courses were done as one year or two years seconded from um, your cooperative society. So co-op societies were investing a huge amount in their, um, in their workforce because many of them, not only were they paying for the students to be learning, but they were also giving them the salaries that they would have, would have earned at home. Um, so it was quite a, quite a big investment. Um, the teaching, of course, whatever sorts of courses that you did, also involved visits to places. Um, visits to the Rochelle Pioneers Museum was, um, was a key one throughout the, the college's existence. Um, visits to CWS, the co-op union, and consumer societies around the place, so that co-ops um, helped to educate the students as well as um, the students just learning and, uh, from books. In the 1990s, things were starting to change quite a lot. Um, there were changes in education. Um, lots of societies were wanting to use their own facilities uh, for courses, rather than sending their students right the way across the country. And courses also changed. The, um, the two year and one year courses that I mentioned earlier had changed completely. Um, so the, the learners were now doing sort of two day intensive um, workshops and then going back to work and doing um, assignments in between. So the, the need for that residential accommodation was, uh, was much less. Um, the college was still improving its facilities um, and was actually providing ensuite batteries in, in some of the places, but it became quite difficult. Um, so the, the college decided to relocate and it relocated back to Holyoke House where it had, had been before. Um, I often say in, in cooperatives, the more you look at them, the more you see circles. Um, and the, the college moved away and came back. And what it came back to was an office base doing the courses where the learners are rather than bringing the learners um, to the, the college, which is the way the clients, the cooperative societies um, are happy with it. So I thought I'd say a bit about a few of the people involved and some of the leaders in particular. Um, we have Professor Fred Hall, who I mentioned earlier. Um, he was a Rochdale lad. He was um, from a family that were closely linked with the Rochdale pioneers. And he actually married a Miss Ada Briggs, who is a granddaughter of one of the original 28. So you can't get much more Rochdale than, uh, than Fred Hall. He was self-educated and eventually became a professor in Belfast. Um, during the time that he was in Belfast, he was becoming more and more linked to the Cooperative Union, encouraging them to set up a college, um, which was, he described it as the coping stone of our, of our educational edifice. Um, he was determined that it would work, hence his paper in um, 1912. Um, he was appointed by the Cooperative Union as their advisor of studies in 1915 um, and when the college started, who better to be principal um, than Fred Hall. And he was principal right up until he died in 1938, um, at which point Dr John Thomas was, uh, was appointed. At this point, the college had a teaching staff of 19 and a clerical staff of 12. Uh, they were dealing with 16,000 exam papers, mm -hmm. huge amounts of paperwork that they were, they were doing. Because of course the college um, was involved in a lot of correspondence courses and distance learning um, rather than just having the, the students that it was dealing with. Um, 
Dr. Thomas was a good Welshman, and he wrote an article um, which appeared in the producer at the time, um, talking about his views for cooperative education and offering to speak with anybody who wanted to, to talk about cooperative education. And if any of his um, homeland cooperative societies in Wales wanted him to talk with them in Welsh, he was quite happy to, to do it. At the time that the college relocated, um, a new principal was, was appointed. He was Lieutenant Colonel Robert Blackie Marshall, and he he's often um, gets his full, full name. Um, he already had an OBE for his army education work. Um, he was appointed in 1945, um, but we had to wait until he was released from the army in the summer of 46 um, before he came. I love the picture of him working in his office with his feet up. Mm -hmm. You can see at the, uh, the other side of his desk. It's quite an amazing man. Um, he finally retired in 1977. Um, and we have a photograph of the two principals, um, Dr. Marshall on the right, and Dr. Halton on the left. Um, he took over as principal in 77 and carried on to, to 94. And I'll, I'll whiz through the, uh, the other principles, because this is all in my working life. Okay. <laughs> um, so it makes me feel very old when I start <laughs> talking about history and stuff I remember. Um, so Robert Wildgust was a uh, principal from 95 to 99. And then Mervyn Wilson was principal from 2000 up to 2015. Um, and now, of course, we have Simon Parkinson, who's, um, who's our current principal. There's also tutors. Um, John Jakes was probably one of the, the best known of the tutors. He was a tutor at the college in the 1930s. Um, he was later the chief executive of Portsea Island Cooperative Society. He was heavily involved in the introduction of self-service retailing to the UK. Um, he was president of Congress, chair of the Co-op Union, and was created Baron Jakes of Portsea Island in wow. 1968. So he's um, quite one of our notable work. Um, Arnold Bonner, um, I owe a personal debt to. Um, he died in the 60s, but when I first came, I learned a huge amount about co-ops by looking at his book, British Cooperation, which is still one of the standard uh, textbooks on the cooperative movement. And another Rochdale lad, he was born in Littleborough and was related to Nathan Holt, who was the Rochdale Pioneer's first full-time librarian. So, um, good co-op links to Rochdale. We have in our collections one copy, only one, of the Cooperative College badge, which all students received, um, we think from the 1930s through to the 1950s. And of course, they show the rainbow of the cooperative movement. Um, it was used as the symbol of international cooperation by the co-op movement um, and shows it going off into the, the distance with the learning. And of course, a book did co-op. We have um, quite a collection of photographs of the student body. Every year they would get the students together um, to have a photograph taken. Latterly, they were taken on the lawn at Stamford Hall. Um, but you'll notice in quite a lot of the earlier ones um, that there aren't very many women involved. And quite a few of the women involved, you'll see on the front row there are two ladies, um, who are actually on the teaching staff rather than the, the students. There was a, a common plea to have more women as students at, uh, at the college. In fact, in the 1949 Congress, the, uh, the question was asked, why can't we have more women? And there were two reasons that were given um, from the, the college's response. One was that um, women were often put off by the lack of facilities, for having to sleep in dormitories and things. Um, and the other, I'm afraid, was the lack of female managers and secretaries within co-op societies. Mm -hmm. So the college threw the, the question straight back at the, the cooperative movement and said that as soon as women believe that they can become managers, 
um, secretaries within the cooperative movement shall come to the, the college. Um, went quiet after that, apparently. But student life um, has always been a mix of work and play. Um, so rather nice picture of the two students and somebody looking at the Higher Purchase Act 1951, which must be really, really fun. Um, sorry, it's 1931, not 1951. Um, but I mentioned that um, study visits were always um, a key part of the, the Cooperative College. And in the Rochdale Pioneers Visitors Book for 1920, there is um, what they described as the first party of whole time students of the movement, the, the Cooperative College. And Fred Hall is there mm -hmm. in amongst us, of course. But one of the interesting things is this is five years before the Cooperative Union bought number 31 Tobin to create the museum. So they were going there before it was a museum. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and seeing it. I mentioned correspondence courses which were always a huge part of the, the college's work. Um, you can see the post office bringing entire bandfuls of, of papers and they had a team of people just working on correspondence courses, both writing the materials and also doing all of the uh, marking. During the war um, they increased the number of correspondence courses. Quite a few people were actually doing the correspondence courses while on active service. Um, they would ship them across. They had an agreement with the military authorities, the Red Cross and the Order of St. John, um, that the armed services could receive and carry on doing their, their courses, um, including if they were prisoners of war. There was an agreement that prisoners of war could carry on with their studies. And they actually used the camp guards as invigilators for the exams. So you could go away, be imprisoned and come back with, with the qualifications you needed to move on in your, um, in your course. And some of the uh, courses were the same as they'd always been. So you have the economics and the cooperative principles and things, but there's a, a rather beautifully described one um, which was called Conflicting Theories of Democracy and Dictatorship, mm -hmm. which I bet went down a bomb in a prison of war camp. Mm -hmm. um, we have, of course, course documentation. Um, this one is from the 1968-69, uh, which includes all of the events that students were going to see while they were, while they were studying. And you can see there's quite a lot of different events going on. Um, the one marked the pilgrimage to Rochdale, of course. Um, we also have statistics to do with courses, both the um, correspondence courses and also the, um, the talk courses at the college. Um, seeing how many people went in for exams, how many people passed exams. And the, um, the college and the always have very high um, pass marks that were needed. Um, so it was not unusual for 50% 50 50 of people to fail an exam. Um, that was considered quite normal in the 50s and, and 60s. Um, so you really had to work hard to get your, your qualifications. I put up um, a couple of the exam questions just as a, a bit of light relief. Um, this is a, an exam from 1924 on cooperation stage two. Stage one is the children's exam. Stage two is the youth's exam. Stage three is for, for adults. Um, but they have some interesting questions. Um, one of them, and you have to answer six questions in three hours. So think how you'd answer this. Define cooperation and give an exact description of the different types of cooperative societies in the movement today. That would take me a lot longer than half an hour, I have to say. Um, and another question, has the cooperative movement any duty respecting the education of its members? If your answer is in the affirmative, describe the attempts that are being made to provide this education. 
and I would love to know how many points they would give you for answering no. <laughs> Of course, facilities were always given for students to do their own research and to, to learn. An interesting comparison between the, the 1950s and the 1960s, um, just the different clothing is quite interesting. All the blazers, complete with college uh, blazer badge um, in the 50s, and then people wearing woolly jumpers in the, in the 1960s. And you can see some of the international students there as well. International students have always been, in, um, been around in the college, right from the outset, in the first intake, um, after Mr. Shonk, the Australian student, went home. The first intake included other Australians, it included somebody from Iceland, um, as well as UK. So it's always been um, international movement has always been part. Um, this picture is during the Second World War and is of Polish students um, who were coming to the, the college. But it's very carefully taken so you can't actually see the damage to the, the building. Pictures of students learning. Um, Students kept scrapbooks, which is quite interesting, showing the different activities that they do, the sports facilities, the, um, some of the in-jokes within the, the college at the time. And they also produced from 1950 a logbook of places to visit in the area. We have some visitors' books. Um, these are ones that were actually given by the Long Eaton Society as a, a gift to the college. And we just put on a, a random page, which has um, the mayor and mayoress of Loughborough, um, somebody from Loughborough College of Art, um, the high commissioner for Ceylon, all in there, and uh, somebody from the colonial office and somebody else from Nigeria. So people would come from all over um, to visit the college to understand what it was doing. Um, and in the 50s, 60s and 70s, there were attempts at a students' association to try and bring together former students so that they could stay in contact. Um, students, of course, also produced their own magazines. The uh, Stokehold was produced from uh, the 1920s and was called that because they felt that education was the stoke hole of the movement, mm. stoking the fires that kept the engines going. And some rather jazzy ones from the, the 1960s and 1970s. And I think you've probably um, heard enough of me talking. So if anybody has any questions, I'll be happy to, to try and answer them. And also, um, we should be making these slides available to people who'd like to have access to them as well. Because mm -hmm. I think there's lots and lots of information there that, um, that I'm sure lots of people would like to be able to see and have time to, to study as well. Because yeah. not all of us have the opportunity to have a Jillian on hand <laughs> and to be able to just pop into the archive and say, oh, can I have a look at this? Um, so I just wanted to um, find out from anyone, um, does anyone have any questions that they would like to ask? And if they do, could they indicate, um, indicate whether they have a question? Stunned everybody into silence. <laughs> well, I, I have a, yeah, I have a question for you, Gillian. Oh, yeah. Is if you were to kind of choose a period of the college's development, which, which period would you say you find the most interesting and why? I think personally, um, I would find the origins of the college, the um, sort of 1919 to 1930 period fascinating because the, it's through that period that they started to develop the correspondence courses mm -hmm. and really learn what being in college was all about. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that would be a fascinating period to, to look at in more detail. Mm. And what do you think has been 
like some of the the biggest changes that the college has has been through in its history as well i think um a lot of the changes are to do with changes in education i mean i was saying that the um the college moved from needing the residential mm. center um partly because so many students had been sent by the British Council and other um, international bodies. Um, so they, the need for that, that had sort of changed. But that also affected how the college was operating because it had um, so many students coming from so many different places mm -hmm. and all learning from each other. And they were making sure that the British movement could learn from those cooperators who were coming. So when the um, students were going out to co-op societies for study visits, it was not a one-way yeah. interaction, it was always mm -hmm. two-way, so that the students were talking about their experience as yeah. well. Um, and I think losing that access to the, those international uh, cooperators must have been very difficult the college um, yeah. that happened at the beginning of the 80s really so mm. it the college has had to adjust from that but it still does so much internationally mm. that it's found other ways of bringing that international knowledge yeah um which is it's interesting to see how that's oh i think we have a i don't know whether someone is there did you have a question michael no, sorry, that was my phone. I did notice <laughs> uh, Angela had a question. Question. Yeah, Angela's got one on the chat. Oh, brilliant. Um, did UK students visit international co-ops too? Yes, um, not so many. The college did used to do the odd um, international study tour. Um, but from 1930s, there was a regular exchange student with, um, I'm just trying to think where it was. I think it was in Denmark. There was a cooperative college there, but they did a, a three month exchange. So people went from one to the other. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, there was a certain amount of, of travel. Mm -hmm. And what other sort of, I'm always just interested in where did those students come from? Where were the kind of more unusual places that people came to the college to learn from? You know, what, what countries? Um, you name a, co a Commonwealth country. Right. They came from that. Mm. Um, the British Council in particular was very keen that the um, government ministers in each country would get as much information about co-ops as mm. possible. So if you were going to be a cooperative minister in, in country, yeah. um, you would be sent to the cooperative college to learn about co-ops in different mm. places and different experiences um, so anywhere and everywhere um, some students were also self-funded so people came from all sorts of countries in africa mm. asia you name it people mm. were coming from there and would though would those people all have spent one or two years studying at the college the, the college was infinitely flexible, mm -hmm. so it had um, regular, they did one term, two term or three term mm -hmm. um, courses, but some people would come for two years, so mm -hmm. they would do um, special courses for, yeah. for them. Um, basically, if somebody wanted a particular period, um, the college could, could organise it. A bit like today, yeah. you know, the, the college is still getting international delegations yeah. who are coming who want to spend a week or two weeks mm. learning and they'll do specialised programmes for them. Mm. Um, it's exactly the same as the college was doing. I just can't imagine the, the, the sort of financial outlay for a, for a society or even a government department to send somebody overseas on a residential course for two years and to then not have that person to have that person being paid their wage whilst they were away, were away and also supported with their learning i mean that's yeah that's phenomenal isn't yeah. it you know the, the the british council and the the other organizations the overseas um, 
organisation, they were making a huge um, investment in cooperatives. Um, through the 1950s and 1960s, mm. cooperatives were definitely viewed as the way forward. Yeah. You know, as, um, as communities were changing, as countries were, were developing, going on for you know, being independent mm. and all sorts of different things. Yeah. Co-ops were viewed as a really good way of moving forward. Mm. Um, and the investment was made. Yeah. I think we've got another question that's come up in the chat box. Did co-ops ever poach international students or offer secondments to them? Um, probably, I think <laughs> is, is, is the answer. Um, there were occasional students who um, stayed on. Yeah. And I think um, when they went out into consumer societies, Sometimes they were offered mm. a post for three months or something. Mm. Um, so the co-op movement would, would poach them. Um, yes, I would say. And did, at that point, did, um, did, you know, for example, today, with the way that the college works without walls, you know, we very much go to where the students are internationally as well as um, in the UK. Did... Did we ever send tutors further afield to teach? Like, did we did we send people over to like to teach African um, co-op yeah. societies? Um, in the um, sort of post-war period, there were several cooperative colleges set up in different countries in Africa, mm. and people from the cooperative college in the UK yeah. would go out um, and spend time there helping the people who are setting up the college to develop the curriculum okay. to um, to know what a co-op college yeah. did and that sort yeah. of thing. Um, and they'd go out for six months or a okay. year or so. So it's similar to today where we do the, the, the training of trainers. It's very Absolutely. similar to help people to develop yeah. the, the learning materials, but also how to teach those learning materials. Yeah. It, it's very much part of the ethos of cooperatives, I would say rather than somebody in the UK saying, we'll come and show you how to do this. It's coming to talk to you about how, how you can do it, how you want to do it. And it's a much more enabling thing than yeah. somebody from the UK taking over and saying, we know what we're doing. Yeah. Well, just before we finish, just has anyone got another question? I've, I've always got hundreds of questions, so I, you know, it doesn't matter if nobody has a... So I, I, yeah, I, haven't got, I haven't got a question, it's just, um, so I'm sitting here at Furcroft College, so it's just fascinating in terms of the similarities and the differences, and so I noticed on one of your slides they came to visit Furcroft and Ruskin on, in the 67-68, so, yeah. so thank you, it's just really interesting. Yeah. yeah, well I mean I wanted to just ask Gillian, like based on her like enormous wealth of knowledge, and also her own personal preferences, um, and, and, and her kind of knowledge of the college as it is today. What do you think is the kind of key area um, that the, the college kind of needs to focus on to make sure that it will last for another hundred years? I think really doing what it's good at, which is helping people to learn from other cooperatives. Mm. It's that, um, giving a space for people to get together and exchange ideas and good practice, which is something that the, the college has always been, been involved in. Yeah. And I think it's needed today more than ever, you know, as in some ways countries are becoming more, more and more separate. I think having something that um, helps people to understand each other mm. is really important. I think cooperation is such a huge thing. Um, you know, some of the, the historians have said it's as old as humanity. Mm -hmm. And it really is. And those ideas can come from anywhere. And anybody can learn from anybody else. And I think one of the things the college, um, in all the research I've done on it, has been really good at, is that bringing people together and helping them to to exchange ideas. Mm. That's fascinating. Well, we, we are just coming up to the end of the webinar now. Um, really, 
yeah. And that, yeah, and someone has made the comment as well, you know, that it's really useful to think about the legacy of the 1919 Ministry of Reconstruction report. And oh. if you are interested in that um, and have heard of, um, I'd just like to say as well, the um, college is also involved in the Adult Education 100 um, project, which is a big collaborative project with the college and the WEA and a, and a variety of other um, stakeholders. Um, and if you sort of look on our website, you can find out more information about that as well. And it's all very, very connected. Um, but I'd really, really like to take this opportunity. Um, oh, and, and Angela has also made a comment about being a student, a client and a tutor. She's loved revisiting the past. <laughs> it's great to know we're continuing with more of the same as Gillian says, and bringing more people together, helping them exchange ideas is absolutely what it's all about. Um, and it is, I mean, I've worked at the college now for nearly three years. This is, some of this has been new to me, but also, you know, I love delving into the past. I love all of this kind of stuff. Um, I've found it absolutely fascinating. And I think you'll agree with me that Gillian is a really, really engaging speaker. I manages to bring kind of dry documents to life in a way that I think very few other people can. Dry? Dry. dry. <laughs> <laughs> like a minute book like Gillian can make a minute book and, and, and an account sheet look exciting you know so um, I just want to say you know thank you Gillian um, she's made my time at the college much more enjoyable because I'm always allowed to come and pester her with, with a variety of questions which she always seems to know the answer to but I'm sure that I'm not the only one I'm sure I'm sure we could find hundreds and hundreds of people who would say exactly the same thing so um, just want to take this opportunity to say thank you, Gillian, for doing the webinar. It's My been pleasure. brilliant. Um, and thank you to everyone else for joining us today because um, I'm sure you've all found it as interesting as me. So thank you very much, Gillian.